WYCTV presents About the Arts with Barbara Lee Diamondstein. Hi, I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein. This is About the Arts, and our guests today are Betty Parsons, the durable godmother of the Midtown art scene, herself an artist as well as a dealer, and Cleve Gray, an artist and one whose work she represents. A warm welcome to you both. For the more than 30 years of the existence of the Betty Parsons Gallery, it's been described as a place where art goes on, and not just one where it is shown or sold. You've helped launch many careers. In fact, more than 200 artists have been shown at your gallery. Can you tell us about some who are among the then unknowns? Whose career did you help launch? Who, who has done what? Whose career did you help launch? Well, uh, in the beginning, I had the, the titans of the art world today, really, like uh, Jackson Pollock, uh, Mark Rothko, Clifford Steele, Bradley Tomlin, Richard Pusidal, uh Hans Hoffman, I gave him his first show, Barney Newman, the only show, the only gallery ever was in, was with me. And I launched them about 20, uh, let's see, 25, 30 years ago. From when 46, they weren't very launchable, at least by... They were, they were absolutely unknown then. And uh, it, it stimulated a great deal of hostility because they were so unusual that the, p the public really were very suspicious of them, which uh, caused a lot of uh, difficulties for me. <laughs> what gave you the courage to select them or the knowledge? I fell in love with them. They were just marvelous, I thought. I couldn't understand why people didn't realize it. And I used to tell people that. <laughs> Well, that's been going on for 30 years, and as such a young man as yourself, I'm astonished to realize that you have been making art for more than 35 years. In that period of time, there are certain color relationships and certain ideas that you continue to explore. I'm about to pose a rather difficult question, but I can think of no one better than yourself to reply to it, and that is, how would you describe your work? It's a tough question. Uh, my work has changed, of course, since it started. Uh, I was a realistic painter, and uh, from that developed into m more abstraction. And now probably I'm uh, what one would call totally abstract, non-objective. Would you say that, Betty? Yes, I certainly would. Uh, He's had fantastic transitions. <coughs> at any rate, this work that I've been doing in the last um, few years has developed from my interest in uh, Chinese painting and is much more calligraphic than the work I've been doing previously. We have some examples of your recent lithographs because besides being a painter and a sculptor, you have an enormous interest in printmaking and in books. But for a moment, why don't we look at some of the prints uh, that you have brought right. with you? Those are prints I did in uh, Israel about two years ago. Uh, I went there uh, as a guest of, uh, of Mayor Kalak, the Jerusalem Foundation, and they gave me a studio and the opportunity to do these lithographs and uh, the aquatints that you probably show later. Betty, you say his work has gone through many transitions. How would you describe those? Well, to begin with, I think he always was a marvelous painter. His, but his, his, his vision or his image uh, changed, which is, I think, perfectly natural for a creative person. Because a, as he got through all these different visions or images that he used, he moved into something else. He started by being a, 50s uh, a very beautiful painter to me. Then he, he, moved into, he became a very romantic painter. His forms and shapes were always, to me, very, very romantic. And I was moved into these signs and symbols, which are part of the whole world. There are some on the screen now, and they certainly are calligraphic. But and rather than transition and reading and knowing somewhat of your work, your earliest, in fact, your Princeton University student thesis related to yes. Chinese art. Yes. So I assume that is an ongoing and recurring theme in your life and in your work. It was, it was a very powerful uh, influence at the time I was at, in college because I had never been exposed to Oriental art before. And uh, it really overwhelmed me at that time. 
And I had hoped that I was going to be able to relate it to the painting I was doing, but I couldn't. Its, uh, its source is so different from Western painting. And I think it's taken me all these years since then. It's about uh, 35 years ago, I guess, I graduated from Princeton, uh, to get back to this uh, terrific desire I had, but no way of uh, expressing it. Um, there's another example of that work that was just on the screen. To the work of what artist do you most respond? Who helped inform your vision? And that's a question, actually, I'd like to ask of both of you. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to ask the question of mm -hmm. Betty Parson, artist rather than dealer. Right. Who, who's, uh, uh, well, you know, I'm one of these people that have very little recall. Uh, you know, what I, I'm not influenced by anybody. So I'm, I was crazy about Van Gogh when I started, and Cezanne. And and uh, and Matisse is my favorite today. I think he's I think he's the greatest to me. He's greater than Picasso. To me, he's greater than all of them. Why? Well, he, to me, he has there's more spirit. You see, uh, uh, Picasso is more the pan man, is the earth, and 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 Matisse to me is much more related to s these higher dimensions, however you want to put it. Yeah. More metaphysical. Yes. More spiritual. Yes, more metaphysical. Yeah. Who informed your creative vision? Oh, Cezanne, surely, to begin with. I think we all begin with Cezanne. Yeah. And then in this country, curiously, John Marin and uh, Feininger uh, affected me very deeply for a long time. But that's Cezanne-esque again. And then Picasso, and then I graduated to Matisse. I agree with Betty. He's the greatest yeah. artist we've had. There's another uh, area of mutual interest, and that is the wonderful John Marin story. Perhaps you might tell us how you became a collector dealer in the first place. I recall reading a wonderful story about Gallery 291, the name given to the early Stieglitz Gallery. And the first show in that gallery was the work of John Marin. Yes, I remember very well. And I wanted very much to buy a John Marin, one of the watercolors. And I went in there. I think what I year is this? This must have been 1923, 20, no, before then, 22, 21, 22, yes. through there. And I went in with, with about $600 to spend, and I found this Marin that I thought was marvelous. And I went up to Mr. Stieglitz, and I said, I'd like to buy that. And he looked me up and down and, 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 I, and said, well, it's $6,000. <laughs> and Marin so I was so shocked that I just crept out of the gallery. And I never d went near a gallery for years after that, because I thought, every, if, if a watercolor is 6,000, God help me on, a, on an oil. It would probably be 60,000. Well, well, it really kills me. Marin yeah. was the then best known of like American it. painters. Well, he was a very independent Stieglitz, you know, and he just decided he didn't like painting, so he wasn't going to sell it to me. Did he know you? No, I didn't know. Well, I'm with your coat is too uh, prosperous looking. Oh, yes, he, I was he, much too prosperous doubles looking. doubles the price, triples the price. Yes, I was married then, if I yeah. That's, that was I the assume <laughs> that uh, it was a lesson that was well learned so that everyone was then free to come into your gallery. Oh, yes, it uh, certainly, certainly were. And I've had some fascinating experiences. Shall I tell you one? Please. Well, years ago, I had an Ad Reinhardt show, and this man came in. He was in rags, and he seemed to have no teeth in his head. And he stayed quite a long time, and finally came up to me and said, what is the price of that? And I said, 1200 He said, fine, I'd like to buy it. So I said, thank you very much, went and get a pencil to write down his name. And it was uh, Stella, Frank Stella. And he bought it. The painter um, Frank Stella. The painter Fra Frank Stella. It took him four or five years to pay for it. But I'll never forget what a shock it was. <laughs> it was Frank Stella. <laughs> <laughs> well, there must be lots of memorable stories that he, relate to your gallery. Oh what yes. are among the most unusual? Well, I've had quite a few. I've had a quite, quite a lot of hostility in the beginning. You know, what I call the heavy artillery used to come in, the elder, uh, elder families of the city. And they really, one was so rude to me once that I said, you know, the elevator goes down every minute and walked out of the room. They didn't have to stay another minute. <laughs> <laughs> Cleve, your work uh, is also very literary. Your interest in John Marin has gone so far as to your writing books about, I guess, the works of artists whose work you admire, John Marin. There were editing jobs, really, mm -hmm. more than writing jobs. How so? I edited uh, John Marin's own writings, mm -hmm. and David Smith's own writings, and Hans Richter's own writings. I did a little introduction for them, but uh, the rest of the book uh, 
uh, was really the work of the artist. And I feel it's the most legitimate kind of book to uh, put out about, about an artist. Yeah, I do too. Are you planning one on your own life and work? No. <laughs> Surely not. Well, uh, we know several of your literary efforts. One of my favorites being a poem on the op-ed page oh, of the God. Times recently. I'd like to forget that. But, no, you're uh, um, you've responded to major issues in your work, both political, works that have had both political connotations and literary references as well. I'm thinking, of course, of a work that uh, was commissioned by the State University of Purchase yes. that took more than two years to complete. It was a 14-panel work called Threnody. Uh, Threnody meaning a song of lamentation. But right. perhaps you might tell us what caused you to do such an enormous, monumental uh, work and what inspired it. Well, of course, the first cause was the fact that I was asked to do it. And uh, the space was so uh, challenging that I couldn't resist it for a second. It's, uh, I think that room must be close to 100 feet long and 70 or 80 feet wide and 22 feet high. So the idea that uh, I was given all of this space to fill was tremendously exciting. And really, because of the heroic size of the space, brought about my wish to make a heroic uh, theme for it. I couldn't see filling a space like that with just uh, a trivial idea. And it was at the time of Vietnam, so of course uh, it was natural for me to uh, turn it into some form of, uh, of protest and uh, of lament for the dead of uh, Vietnam. And it came at a fortunate time because I had been working with a, a vertical figure, which was uh, a simple figure which originally started from some new drawings I had made in, in a drawing class I went to just to keep up with my uh, drawings. And uh, they were female nudes, and the female nude became combined in my idea with uh, the gods and goddesses and the pillars of, uh, of which represented gods and goddesses that I had just seen in, in Greece and in Crete. And that form also took on connotations of the male after a while, so that I was able to combine man and woman and nature and humanity. And uh, it was the form I finally used for Threnody. Well, there may not always be an issue, or such as Vietnam, for you to respond to. What are the contemporary issues that engage your thinking? None whatsoever. Is that why I, your I, current I, work is not <laughs> entitled? No, it's simply that uh, I really have gotten to the point where I can no longer uh, relate what I'm doing to uh, political issues. And so I've divorce them in my mind completely. And if I have political thoughts, I try to make a political action rather than uh, try to act it out in my work. I think that a certain time in your life arrives when uh, you're so involved with your own work and your own uh, personal development that uh, the outside world drops off. Sounds selfish, but uh, I think it might be necessary. Well, it also sounds like that metaphysical idea that you referred to earlier. I assume the two of you also share that certain uh, surrender to the spirit that is reflected in the subtlety of your work. Yeah. How uh, marked an influence is that in your life and work? Well, very much so, because I, I think that the creative is the, the unknown quantity is. is is always the creative th thing that I go for. You know, there's always something you, you don't see that's there that I'm trying to put. When I, when I do a piece of sculpture, it's the back that I think of, because I can't see it. And it makes the front better, <laughs> somehow, the way I work. It, it makes it, it gives it more form. And the same way with painting, you know, it's kind of a rhythm and, and a feeling and a mood that I'm after in painting. You know. To much of your current work, there is a meditative stillness. Um, where does that come from? Well, of course, it comes out of the Oriental uh, uh, philosophy. 
and um, it comes out of my own desire to do meditative painting because I think that uh, the aspect uh, in painting which is most missing now is uh, the meditative aspect. Most of contemporary work uh, I find much too direct and much too immediate in its uh, effect upon the person who looks at it. I would rather do the kind of work that requires more time to uh, assimilate and uh, give the person an opportunity to let their own thoughts move into the work and maybe pass into some realm that they hadn't uh, uh, expected to find. This is a thought I had in Threnody at, uh, at the Neuberger Museum. <clears throat> I tried to make a room in which the student, who was so busy during the day, having ideas pushed into their heads, a room into which they could go and uh, sit and let the uh, forms that were uh, placed around the wall, almost like a dance, uh, be a vehicle for their thoughts so that they could move along in the forms and uh, perhaps be able to uh, meditate on some aspect that might be troubling them or help calm their... Where is Threnody now? <laughs> in the basement of the museum. And what is its permanent uh, It home? probably will go back. It was up for uh, two or three years, and uh, now they have a, a Nevelson uh, show there. Quite a wonderful one. Good. And uh, hopefully it will go back someday, because it really doesn't belong anywhere else. It was made specially for that room. Well, both of you have the happy circumstance of having major shows this summer. Um, your work of the last decade, Cleve, that is, I guess, from 1966 through the present, will be shown at Albright Knox Art Gallery in Buffalo for a good part of the summer. And yours, Betty, will be at the RISD, the Rhode Island School of Design in Providence, Rhode right. Island, yeah. for a good part of the summer. What will be contained in the, your show of your own work? Well, I'm showing about 20 big paintings and some watercolors and the uh, and about 10 uh, wooden structures, and some, maybe some drawings. No. In any period of time, or? Uh, well, you know, over a period of about five years, I'd say. Over the last five years. And your show is of the last decade? Yes, but principally of the last year and a half. I would say two-thirds or three-quarters of the show uh, represents the last year and a half, and then the previous 10 years are simply to place the last year and a half in perspective. And the work, of course, is very reminiscent of some of the things that we've shown here today because yes. it is so heavily influenced in the most lyrical and beautiful fashion, I've had the privilege of seeing some of them, by the uh, calligraphy that you described. Betty, you were Cleve's dealer. How did that ever come about? Well, uh, Cleve appeared one day <laughs> with some of his work, and I thought it was marvelous, so I took him on. How long ago was that? Uh, that must be about, what, 50 years ago? Something like that. Something yeah. like that, because he's had many shows with me. Actually, is that I, the way you I, remember I, I it, too? No. <laughs> <laughs> I pursued Betty because I admired her so for, you know, 30 years, 25 years. And uh, I just dreamed someday that uh, she would like my work well enough to take it on. But she didn't when I started. No, no, I was no. much too realistic for her. You're too realistic, and then you would, it was too... too romantic. <laughs> well, and also you were very close to the French yeah. at that time. Yeah. And I wanted something that was more independent, you know, which I'm always pursuing. <laughs> Has Betty Parsons' dealer ever shown Betty Parsons' artist? No, never. I never hoped to. Why? Well, because it's, it's too much. I don't want to stand up and sell my own work. You know, it's embarrassing. It would be embarrassing to me. Well, you want other people to sell it. Why would that be? Well, I could, but I'd rather... I have, I have, another, I have a dealer who takes care of me, Jill Cornbley. Yeah. I had a show this winter, you know. I do, indeed. Yeah. How does an artist make your grade? On what basis did you select what artists to be a part of this legendary gallery? Well, oh, I'm interested in the creative approach. So whenever I found an artist that I really felt was trying to say something on his own, you know, with some sort of technical ability, I, 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 I took him on, and there are not too many of them. 
Are there any now? Do you still look at new work? Oh, I certainly do. What's I'm the looking schedule? at it all the time. How do you do that? Well, they come, they, they're at my door, they're on the telephone. I get I have letters from all over the country wanting to show, you know. And a lot of them have uh, interesting but not good enough. They haven't found themselves enough. You see, they have to integrate in themselves before I'm interested. You know. Do you see a difference? Uh, lots of people characterize the current art scene as a time of marking time, of synthesizing. Yeah, well, I, it's, it's very different uh, from, say, five, uh, e five or six years ago, because I think all, uh, there's no, no more isms so much anymore. There's no more sort of schools of painting and, and fashions in painting. The, the artist is more or less trying to find out uh, what he has to say himself, because I've just been doing many, many shows around this country in this spring, and I found a lot of talent. I found no giants, but a lot of talent, and each very independent. But in their own time, did you find even those names that you mentioned earlier, did you think of them as giants when you first started yes, to did. show them? From square one, you knew that their well, talent they was They had monumental. so much energy, so much vitality, so much excitement, you know, that I really did think they were terrific. Really what did. do you see as the next wave in art? Well, uh, uh, whatever the next drama is going to be, because uh, I think the giants need a kind of a drama, you know, to... To animate them? To make them very great, you know. It, I, I'm, I hope that it'll be an international uh, kind of passion to make the world... I, believe, I don't believe in nationalism, you see. I think the whole world's got to get together. You know? And I think each country should hang on to what, it's, what it is, but it should understand the other country, too. If it wants to hang on to what it is, it should be sympathetic to what that other country is. And you see art as a galvanizing... Well, art, I think art... You know, as somebody said in one of these lectures I've heard lately, that, that God is dead, and it now it's up to the artist. And how does this artist feel about that? <laughs> no, so much about you. I don't want to think too much about that. Uh, I aspect. don't think they should think about it. You see, it just happens. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's really yeah. my reaction. Because that's to pretentious. It. You can't think about it. It has. It happens. There's kind of a leadership there somewhere. You know. You're also well known as a collector, and many of the best works that you have from what I understand, were partially gifts from some of the defectors of your gallery. Yeah. Uh, people who you discovered mm -hmm. and launched and ultimately left for more lucrative arrangements with other dealers. Yes, right. Did that happen often? Oh, often. Didn't you resent that, to invest all that energy and time and Well, yes, it was, it was very disappointing. But, uh, but I, I faced the reality, I never had any capital to subsidize, and other dealers did. And, and we can't have to have money, so what could I do? Who are some of your best-known defectors? Well, I mean, a great many. Pollock left me, Sidney Janus. Rothko left me, Sidney Janus. Uh, Clifford Still just went on his own. Barney Newman went on his own. You know, he, he, and uh, Hoffman left me for Sidney Janus, because he thought my, I was too young when I took him on. Uh, a younger man left me for Pace, just recently. Kelly left me for... Sidney Janus, all for money. Well, maybe they liked people. They were, there may have been many other reasons, too. Mm. In this extraordinary collection of works of art that you've had, I've heard it characterized that there are the well-known and the yet-to-command, if ever, public attention. Yeah. How did you select the works other than those that were gifts? Well, I just, I'm still buying drawings, and I need a drawing like I need a third nose, <laughs> but I can't resist it. I have, it's, it's a, it's a, it, it's a vice with me, and you know, I see something that, I, that seizes me. I want it. <laughs> is that the way it is with most collectors? Is it an addiction? It can be, yes. I think very often it is. What is your most prized possession? Uh, well, I think the desire to possess drawings and beautiful things. I won't mention any one name. But drawings more than anything else. Uh, yes, draw I'm very, I'm, I'm very we uh, susceptible to drawings. Why? Because it's the secret to me of, of the artist. In the drawing, I see where they, where, what's going to happen. You know, like letters are to me in writers. They're, they're letters of, the, uh, of what they're going to eventually write. About, what's in the letter, eventually they're going to write about it. Are you a collector too, uh, please? Not anymore. 
uh, I used to trade a lot with uh, my friends and and buy occasional things. The only thing I bought recently is some primitive art, some New Guinea pieces that I find very powerful. But uh, I don't have the desire to uh, possess that still encourages Betty on. Well, I'd make exchanges. Some of the artists like my work very much. We'll make exchanges. Kelly just exchanged a drawing for one of my wooden things instead of the yeah. younger one. So I get an accumulation. <laughs> But there is such a philosophical and literary root to much of your work, and you've often described it that way, too, that there is a certain inseparability of life and death, and it is reflected in your work. Yes. Is that an accurate way to describe how you feel? Uh, I do think that painting at its best is visual philosophy, and uh, I think that there has to be, uh, in the end, uh, a great deal of thought behind uh, what goes into a painting, not necessarily in, on the technical side, but behind the reason for the image you use and the technique uh, you use also. Uh, because if it's going to last at all in the person's mind, there has to be much more than just an immediate sensation. That's why I feel the, uh, the meditative aspect of contemporary art has been neglected. At a time when uh, Newman and Rothko were, were working, it was very, very strong. There was no one more philosophically uh, profound than Barney Newman. Newman. No, nobody. And this shows in the work. I don't think an artist uh, uh, can leave anything out of his work. I think everything he is uh, goes into the work. And uh, so. I think it's important for younger artists to realize that uh, they can't just work on the, the visual aspects, they have to work also on the, the mental or the spiritual aspects of themselves. It's something that the both of you have done for an entire lifetime. It's a real privilege to have you both with us today. Thank you, Betty Parsons, painter, dealer, collector, Cleve Gray artist. You'll have an opportunity to see great deal of their work this summer at Albright Knox Art Gallery of Cleve's work and at RISD of Betty's work. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein and thank you audience for being with us too. Uh -huh.